you're excited about the word, listen, I want to encourage you, whether you're Fountain Family or Fountain Faithful, thank you once again for rocking with me this Wednesday. Lord over this church. He's the chief overseer. He is the head shepherd. Are you? He's the bishop of our souls. He is Lord, and we have to be under his authority to use his authority. And you and I are citizens of the kingdom, and our kingdom has laws and rules, and they're found right here in the scripture, which is why it's so important to have our constitution. Come back, all right, y'all with me? All right, rock with your boy. Hit like and share right now because because I'm about to get in it, all right? What's up, family? It's your boy, Bishop Jaron C. O'Neill in the house here at the Fountain Church International in Pomona, California. Want to welcome you to another episode of Rock With Me Wednesdays. Listen, as Israel would say, it's a new season, it's a new day. A fresh anointing is on the way. It's 2024. Happy New Year to you. It's good to be back in the house. I am ready to rock with this new series that we have. God has been talking to me, and I couldn't wait to get back in the pulpit and preach the word to you. I want to welcome all of our first-time viewers for the very first time. Listen, go on over to the App Store, download the Fountain app. Why? Because it's the number one way to stay connected with us, number one way to stay abreast of all the latest news and updates, everything that's happening at the church. You can watch this message through the app. You can give through the app. You can make prayer requests through the app. Uh, you'll get all of the notifications and advertisements of what's happening at the church. We want you to be a part of it, so be sure to download the app and turn on your notifications so you'll get all the prompts, all right? I also want you to like and share this broadcast. Listen, let your friends and family know it's on. It's Rock With Me Wednesdays, and I want them to rock with me. So go ahead and send them an invite, copy the link, put it in a text message, hit them on Facebook, hit them on YouTube, hit them on the app. Listen, we're on all of those platforms, uh, Fountain App, website, Facebook, YouTube, go check it out, all right? Be sure to pep, uh, uh, let everyone know th that we're on. Also, let me know where you're watching from. I want to know that you're at church with me here tonight, so go ahead and post your city, your state, what country you're viewing us from. Amen. Even if you watch after the live broadcast, go ahead and in the uh, chat, go ahead and put what city, state, or country you're watching us from so we know how far we're reaching. And again, you help us reach the world when you like and share this broadcast, okay? Uh, also, I just want to encourage you all to get your Bible, get your notes, amen, get your pen, lay aside all distraction. It is time for the ministry of the Word, and w this is Bible study, and we're going to study the Bible today. So you're going to need your Word. So gather your family around. We're going to pray, and we're going to get started. Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, Father, we exalt you. We praise you. Uh, we exalt you together. We thank you for bringing us into this new season, a new year. We thank you for a fresh counsel. Today, we thank you for fresh anointing for this series, Father. We thank you for the power of God uh, going forth. We thank you, Lord, that I will bullseye the matters of the heart, touch right where people live. Uh, let me be in their text messages. Let me be in their conversations. Let me answer questions that they've always had. I thank you that I will give the full counsel of God as I minister the word today. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth and only bring truth and no error. Father, we thank you that we will be establishing your word as a result of the teaching tonight and that you will get all the glory, souls will be saved and added to the kingdom. All that agree, shout hallelujah and amen. Well, family, you know, over the last uh, year, we were teaching on a series called Obedience, the Missing Ingredient. And within that series, we've had several sub-series where we dealt with the different governments of God. And God was talking to us, and we ended uh, last year dealing with civil obedience, civil obedience. And I just want to review just a couple of things uh, one of the things that we talked about, if they'll put that slide up, these were the governments of God. We've been talking about the fundamentals of obedience. Beginning of the series, we talked about the uh, foundational aspects of obedience, and then we went to marriage, and we dealt with how the Bible tells us to live out obediently in marriage. What does the Bible have to say about marriage? Then we went to parenting and the family dynamic. Praise God, and that was a very, very good uh, series there. And then we dealt with obedience in the workplace. We talked about the workplace doctrine. Yes, God has a doctrine of the workplace. 
And so that was a powerful, powerful time uh, in God's word. And then uh, number four, which we uh, just finished, was dealing with obedience to civil government. So with all this political upheaval, we wanted to find out what does the Bible have to say about believers rioting or believers marching or uh, believers obeying the government or disobeying the government as we've had a lot of government mandates. What does the Bible say about that? So if you have not been with this, you can go right there to the website and get these previous messages. And now it is time to deal with the church government. These are the five governments of God. And we know from scripture that all government is from God. All governments, all authority is from God. And so we're gonna talk about that today, all right? So as we begin to talk about obedience in the church, I believe it's imperative that we understand what a church is. What a church is. People think they know what the church is, and they really don't. Unfortunately, many people in the world, but also in the church, do not know what the church is. And because they misunderstand it, uh, they often uh, have the wrong expectations, unrealistic expectations, and worst of all, unbiblical expectations of the church. And so if they don't know what the church is, they certainly don't know what the pastor's role is or the apostle or the other fivefold ministry gifts or elders, right? And, and so they think they know what a church is. And so they put their personal opinion on the church and its leaders and its conduct. And so they'll say things on social media or say things over the news, and they do not know what the church is. But the Bible tells us what the church is. All of our doctrine comes from the word of God. And so because so many people view the church uh, wrongly and they don't understand the doctrine of the church, uh, they see the church as a social club. They see it as a fellowship hall. Uh, some see it as uh, the runway for fashion, amen? Uh, some, some see it as an entertainment center, so they want messages that are entertaining or they want music that is entertaining. Uh, and then uh, some believe that the primary focus of the church is to only encourage and, and lift you up and make you feel loved and, and you know, find your best friend in it and just... You know, they, they, they look for churches uh, like they look for cruise ships. So they're looking for all the amenities uh, that a church has before they decide to join it. And a lot of this comes from bad doctrine concerning the church or not knowing what the church is and what it is supposed to do. So uh, because of this, I, well, a lot of times I hear people think that the church's primary function is to give away all of its money to the poor uh, or to, to, to clothe and feed the hungry and that we're only here as a distribution center of benevolence. And I'm here to tell you, while those are important functions, and people should feel loved at the church, and people should feel encouraged, and they can hear what God has for them, and we should feed the homeless, and we, we do all of those things and do outreach, that is not the primary focus or purpose of the church. Uh, we can even look at Jesus' statement when Judas was upset that the woman was washing her his feet with her hair and pouring an expensive oil on him, preparing his body because Judas did not understand the purpose. He, uh, uh, you know, misinterpreted uh, what the woman was doing. And he said, hey, we could, we could have sold this oil and given it to the poor. And Jesus rebuked him and said, uh, the poor you will have with you always. So even though we're supposed to give to the poor, even Jesus had a moment says, this is not for the poor. This is, this is not this moment. So it's important uh, for us to have the right doctrine and understand prophetically and biblically and doctrinally uh, what the church is supposed to do and what the function of its leadership is supposed to do. Because if we talk about obedience, as we talk about obedience in the church or the church government, we need to find the origins of it, which would help us to understand why God expects and commands obedience and order in his church. Somebody say, let there be order in the church. So, Again, I want you to understand this key point. We must learn the difference between church doctrine and the doctrine of the church. We must learn the difference between church doctrine and the doctrine of the church. Church doctrine, let me explain them both. Church doctrine are the foundational doctrines and tenets of the church. It's where we learn basic theology. It's where we learn uh, how, who God is, um, 
and how he feels about us and how we should feel about God. So theology is important. It's uh, church doctrine is also, you know, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of laying on of hands, right? The doctrine of uh, repentance of dead works, right? In Hebrews chapter six, we'll talk about that in, in the next series, right? We're going to talk about those foundational doctrines, how to forgive, how to tithe. What is the doctrine on tithe? Those are all doctrines of the church. Um, and so it is very different than uh, the doctrine of church. Does that make sense? So there's doctrines in the church, and then there's a doctrine of the church, or what the church doctrine is. Are you with me? All right, hopefully I made sense with that. Second Timothy 3 and 16. Let's turn there. Second Timothy 3 and 16. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is what? Profitable for what? Doctrine, the rules, the regulations, the how, how do we live out this Christian lifestyle? We go to the scripture to find the doctrine. Look what it says. Uh, it's profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we go to the scripture to find out the doctrine of the church and the doctrines in the church. Does that make sense? Okay, and, and why? Because not only the, uh, the scripture profitable for doctrine, but also for re reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. So if we don't learn these doctrines, we won't be fully equipped to do the work of the church. So in other words, if you just know uh, the doctrines of the church and not the doctrine of, uh, if, if you only know the doctrines in the church and not the doctrine of the church, then you will not be fully equipped to do the work of the church because you will have false expectations and unrealistic understanding and the wrong definitions, right? So it's very important for us to understand the difference between the church doctrine and the doctrine of the church. Does that make sense? It's gonna be very clear in just a moment. So uh, the doctrine of the church is among the doctrines or church doctrine, all right? And I think it should be taught first and the reason it should be taught first is because if you do not understand the doctrine of the church and, and you only understand church doctrines, so you understand tithing, you understand salvation, you understand baptism, you understand all those things, but you don't know why you're doing those things, then you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You're not equipped to go out there and do the work and actually apply those teachings. Does that make sense? So the, church, uh, the doctrine of the church is among the doctrines and here's what it deals with. The doctrine of the church encompasses the origin and the primary function and purpose of a church. It is in this study of the original function that we find the fundamental purpose of the church. When you understand the true purpose, then all the other scriptures will begin to make sense. When you understand the true purpose of the church, all the other scriptures that you've read about the church, why Jesus said what he said, why the apostles did what they did, those scriptures will begin to make sense when you understand the origins and the function of a church. You will understand why Jesus and his apostles did and said the things that they did. So let's look at the first mention of the word church in the Bible. And I believe this is always important when studying a particular doctrine in the Bible, as you go to the first mention of it in Scripture. And that's here in Matthew chapter 16. We'll start at verse number 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. Rock with you, boy. I promise you we're going somewhere. All right? All right. Praise God. Let's read it together. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. This is where Peter gets his name changed. And on this rock, read it with me, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades 
or hell shall not prevail against it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. So here Jesus, this is the first time in scripture that Jesus mentions the word church. And I want you to notice that he said, first of all, the only way that Peter would be able to discern this revelation was by uh, his father, which is in heaven. Only the Holy Spirit could reveal this uh, to Peter. And he says, it is upon this rock that I am the Christ that I will build my church. It is upon this rock, that rock that he is the Christ, this revelation that he is the Christ, that he will build his church. And then immediately when he establishes the church, notice the church is in a, a state of war because the gates of hell are trying to prevail against it. The moment, let me say that again, the moment that Jesus mentions the church, he talks about the warfare against the church. All right? Now, that's going to make sense in just a moment. Because what you begin to find is that the church is a military organization. And when we look here at the Greek word for church, uh, which is the word ecclesia or ecclesia, ecclesia, all right? I've heard it pronounced a few different ways, but we'll go with ecclesia, all right? And so it is a derivative of what is called the calling out, or ek means, uh, uh, means uh, call, uh, calling out, okay? The calling out, a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, a Jewish synagogue, or Christian community of members, or on earth, or saints in heaven, or both. So Jesus is revealing the concept of the church but I want you to notice, unlike any other doctrine that Jesus establishes, he does not go into detail about this church. He does not give the details on what a church is. He just says, upon this rock, I will build my church. In the Old Testament, the ecclesia, and again, uh, this word called out, uh, which we call the church today, right? Ecclesia is the Greek word. Church is what we call it in English. Uh, you see here that it's talking about this religious congregation, but I'm here to tell you that it didn't start out as a religious congregation or a Christian community. Uh, the Ecclesia was actually hidden in a mystery in the Old Testament and revealed later in the New Testament, particularly in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, which is what we read. So the Old Testament, the Ecclesia was hidden in a mystery which means it was shown in the Old Testament in symbols, in types, and prophetic imagery. We'll look at one example. It's important to understand this. We'll look at one example of the Ecclesia or the church in the Old Testament when it was hidden in a mystery. You'll know this story as Jacob's Ladder. It's found in Genesis 28, verse number 10. We'll read through this, talk about a couple things, and we'll move to the next piece, okay? Let's look here in Genesis 28 and 10. Again, this is important for you to understand uh, the doctrine of the church, okay? The origins of the church. All right, so now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. We're in Genesis 28, verse number 10. Verse number 11 says, So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his, at his head and laid down in that place. Then... Uh, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and, the, and its top reached to the heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, uh, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, and to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. 
for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And this is the what? The gate of heaven. All right. Uh, which was known as Bethel or the house of God. Uh, the gate of heaven, Bethel, the house of God. And it was what? A gate. It was a gate uh, from heaven. All right. So you see here, this was the dream, the prophetic dream, and it has imagery and a symbol where he's sleeping and he wakes up, he sees this ladder. It's reaching from heaven on down to the earth, but there are angels ascending and descending on it. And it's known as the gate of God or the gate of heaven, also known as the house of God. This is the church hidden in a mystery, prophetic Im imagery, symbols and types, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, where God had not revealed what he was going to do, but he was showing the symbols, types, imagery. And uh, through a veil, you could see dimly that this was the church. Because remember, uh, uh, Jacob actually wakes up, takes the rock that he was sleeping on. He lifts the rock up and pours oil on it. Well, what does oil represent? That represents the Holy Ghost. Who's the rock? Jesus. Or, and once the oil or the Holy Spirit comes on the rock, he becomes the Christ. And he makes a vow and says, uh, if God does all that he says he's going to do, I'm going to tithe in this place. So even the, the type and the shadow and the prophetic imagery of even uh, Jesus Christ being the, the rock of the church, the anointed rock and tithing in the church is right there in Genesis 28. Are you seeing it? But it's through a veil. It's through symbols and types. But Jesus later confirms in John 1, verse 51, that he is the ladder that Jacob saw that angels would ascend and descend in the New Testament. Are you with me? So it was hidden in a mystery. The ecclesia, the house of God, the temple, all those things are hidden in that mystery and that Jesus Christ would be the head of it. He's the ladder. He's the connection between the heaven and the earth in the house of God. Are you with me? Now, before we go on, let's go to Ephesians 3.8. Because here we talk about, so we saw, the, we saw the prophetic imagery. We saw the mystery. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 3.8 concerning the ecclesia, okay? Ephesians 3.8 says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all see, look at what it says, what is the fellowship of, of the mystery. Well, what's the fellowship? The fellowship is the ecclesia. And, and as an apostle, he's saying, God has given me the responsibility to unfold this mystery. And, he, and then he says, why? He says, to the intent, or, or, or which, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So from the beginning of the ages, what has been hidden? The ecclesia the mystery of the fellowship, the fact that he was going to bring us all together. He hid it from the beginning of the ages in a mystery. And then he says, uh, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities, powers, and heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What is Paul saying? Listen, I am now in the New Testament, and I've been given the responsibility to unveil the Ecclesia. In the beginning, it was hidden, but now I've come to make known the mystery of the fellowship. So the principalities, the angels, the ones who tried to stop you from knowing God, the fallen ones, I'm going to show the complex, many-sided, multifaceted, multi-textured wisdom of God through the church when he has drawn his people back to him and literally made a connection between heaven and earth. Are you with me? And that was hidden from the angels in a mystery. And now I'm going to show forth to the angels. See, you tried to stop me, but you couldn't block me. Are you listening? Rock with me. We're going somewhere. Okay. We're, we're, we're moving forward. So, so we hear, uh, we heard hidden in a mystery and it didn't mean that the Ecclesia didn't exist. It just means it was veiled. And the scripture tells us why he veiled it. 
he veiled it. If you go to 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, it will tell us why God veiled the church in a mystery. Why didn't, why didn't he just show it in the Old Testament? Why didn't he just say, hey, I'm going to build a church in, in the book of Exodus? Why didn't he say, hey, I'm going to build a church, uh, uh, you know, in, in Isaiah? Why didn't he say that? Well, here's the reason why. 1 Corinthians 2 and 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Here's the part. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Here's why. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Before the ages for our glory. Here it is. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have never, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, Why? Now we know why it was hidden in the mystery. Why did God hide the Ecclesia in a mystery in the Old Testament to only be revealed in the New Testament after or just before he goes to the cross? Which is why he said, don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ, because if you tell them that I'm the Christ, they won't kill me. And if they won't kill me, I can't establish my church. And if they don't kill me, I will not be able to be the connection between heaven and earth, between which angels ascend and descend. So I have to die. And if you reveal my purpose, if you pull away the veil beforehand, then the church won't exist. Are you with me? So, so, so the enemy would not know God's plan. It was hidden in a mystery. So the enemy would not know God's plan to reconcile man and pull them into this thing called the ecclesia, the called out one, the church. The church exists because of Jesus being the Christ. And the Christ had to die and be resurrected so he could be the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So as, for, as, as far as the four gospels are concerned, Jesus used the word translated church in your Bible only three times. Only three times. He did it in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, where he says, uh, upon, this, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. And the next time he says it is in um, uh, Matthew chapter 18, 17, where he's talking about de- dealing with disputes in the church, where he says, you know, uh, gather three or more uh, if there's an offense between you and your brother and take them before the whole church. It's, uh, the other two times are in, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse number 17. Well, well, I want you to consider, Jesus only uses the word church three times in scripture but yet it's the end game. You would think he would talk about it much more. The first time he talks about it, it's at war. The second time he talks about it, they're holding judicial or court proceedings of putting someone out of the church because of an offense and a dispute. Again, Jesus mentions the word church. He's the rock, the chief cornerstone of the church. The first time, it's at war. The second time, it's judicial proceedings. I'm going somewhere. So think about this. Now, Jesus is talking about this church. And normally when he talks about something, he would explain it to his disciples, but he doesn't explain it. And nine times out of 10 in scripture, when the disciples did not understand something that Jesus said, he would pull, they would pull him aside and ask him privately, what does this mean? Remember when they couldn't cast out the demon? Uh, of the boy who was having seizures. And they pulled him aside privately and said, Lord, um, why couldn't we cast out this demon? He says, you know, this kind don't come up by prayer and fasting. Uh, There's another time where Jesus is talking to them in parables and they call him aside privately after he gets finished teaching and says, Jesus, why, 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 you know, why do you talk to them in parables? He says, because it's been given for you to know and for them not to know. Am I right about it? So when the disciples did not understand something, they would do what? They would ask Jesus privately. But the disciples never asked Jesus privately, what is a church? Especially if they're supposed to build it. Here's why. Since the church was the end game, you would think that Jesus would spend the bulk of his time teaching about the church. What is the church? How to plant a church? How to grow a church? how to market for the church, right? All the stuff that we're concerned about, you know, how to get the pews filled. No, he didn't do that. 
Jesus never gives the doctrine of the church, uh, the doctrine about the church, only the doctrines of the doctrines within the church or church doctrines. He, he talked about how to forgive. He talked about how to love. He talked about communion. I mean, he, he talked about all of that. We get all that doctrine, but about the church itself, the entity, the institution of the church, he does not talk about. He reveals that he's the chief cornerstone, which is the foundational stone of the doctrine. And then he talks about giving them the keys to the kingdom. And the reason why is the key point, the disciples already knew what a church was. The disciples already knew what a church was. Jesus didn't, the disciples never asked Jesus what a church was because they already knew what a church was. In Israel, during the time of Jesus' birth and all throughout his life on earth, there were three main institutions in Israel. The first one was the temple. This was where there was the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. This is where they gathered for all of those major feasts. And this was on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Are you with me? This was one of the main uh, uh, religious institutions. The second one was the synagogue. The synagogue would be in their local town. It's where they would go every Sabbath uh, when Jesus went to his hometown to sit down and, and hear the reading. And he got up and he read uh, Isaiah, uh, where he says that, you know, uh, the Lord has anointed him on this day, right? So there would be local synagogues in, uh, their, in their neighborhoods or in their communities or in their cities or their countries. And then they would travel to the temple in Jerusalem during major feasts and, and holy days. And then there was the ecclesia, the ecclesia. I assume that all three were religious institutions, but the only, but only the temple and the synagogue were actually religious. Catch this, key point, the ecclesia was not religious, it was actually secular. It was secular, all right? This is important for us as we get ready to build, okay? The ecclesia was secular. It was first developed as a ruling assembly of citizens in the Grecian democracy to govern its city-states. So when they would take over a country, uh, they would have their main city and then the surrounding regions would have ecclesias or assemblies of ones that were from the citizenship of Greece. Okay, now, now pay attention close, all right? It consisted of men 18 years or older who had done two years of military service. So in order to be in the ecclesia, you already had to be ready for military service. You would have had to have served for at least two years in the military in order to be in the ecclesia, what we know today as the church, okay? In other words, you had to be fully, uh, the people of the uh, assembly had to be fully committed to their city-state. So even though you were in another region, you had to be fully committed to Greece. You had, and you would have proven that because you went to war for Greece or you served in the military, okay? So you couldn't be in, listen, you couldn't be in the ecclesia, in the church, unless you were ready to fight, if necessary. The ecclesia also came to mean the assembly of citizens formally called to a meeting. So the uh, assembly wasn't open to everybody. You had to be formally called into the ecclesia. Okay? This is important to understand. This is the origins of the ecclesia, what we know today as the church. When the more hierarchical Romans, because remember the Romans uh, seceded the Greeks, they took the same, the same concept of the Ecclesia, uh, they took the same concept of the Ecclesia uh, in the imperial scene, the Romans assimilated the same concept and they co-opted what the Grecians had built. So they also used uh, Ecclesias. Are you with me? The Greek uh, Ecclesia was so successful, you still had the Hellenistic influence during the Roman rule. And we see this in Acts chapter 19, which we may get to next week because we're just about out of time. All right. So it was still there. There were, there were secular ecclesias in the book of Acts while the apostles were trying to establish 
a religious or Christian ecclesia. It's important to understand. All right? So the general public in Jesus' day understood ecclesia to mean both the secular institution and the governmental system that it represented. So when Jesus said, church, upon this rock I will build my church, the disciples already understood the concept because they already understood the governmental purpose of an ecclesia. They already understood the military implications of the ecclesia. They already understood that it represented the gate of the kingdom that it came from, even though it was in another country. They already understood that everyone in there was there for military purposes to, catch this, to assimilate the surrounding regions to the kingdom that it represented. Are you catching this? All right. So here was the purpose of the ecclesia. Here was the purpose of the ecclesia. It was to be an assembly of fully indoctrinated people sent to colonize the surrounding area. At the time it was city-states, but it's the Ecclesia exists to colonize the surrounding area. Number two, the Ecclesia represented the full weight and authority of the kingdom that sent it. It represented the full weight and authority of the kingdom that sent it. And another interesting thing I noticed about the Ecclesia is where two or three citizens were, it was like the emperor was there like the emperor was actually there. So this explains why when Jesus mentions, number one, the church, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he's saying that because he knows the ecclesia is military in nature. It is there to colonize wherever it establishes, uh, wherever it's established, to get them ready for the customs, the customs, the doctrines, the, the, the culture, of the king that's gonna come. So the whole purpose of the Ecclesia, uh, particularly under the Romans, was to make sure that when Caesar actually came to the city-state, it felt like Rome, even though he wasn't in Rome. Are you catching this? So just like the secular Ecclesia, the church exists with a bunch of military operatives that represent the full weight and authority of the kingdom of heaven to make sure that when Jesus gets here, everybody has already been assimilated and ready for the culture and the customs. So when Jesus gets here, it feels like heaven. It feels like, it feels like home. Are you with me? So that's the purpose. And so uh, now we know why Jesus said, catch this. He says, uh, if your brother sins against you, Go to your brother. And if he hears you, you be reconciled to your brother. But, but if he doesn't hear you, take him to the ecclesia and get two more witnesses. And then it says, where there are two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That was one of the rules of the ecclesia. Which is why the scripture also says, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. That was one of the rules of the Ecclesia, that if there were two or three citizens, it was like the emperor was there making the ruling. So this is why if they didn't hear the church and you took it to the elders, you could put them out because why? You had the right number of people for a judicial ruling within the Ecclesia. God just wasn't just saying, Jesus wasn't just saying things. Now we know why the scripture says, you are an ambassador of Christ because an ambassador is in a foreign country in what is called an embassy, and that embassy is sovereign land. So again, if you have an embassy in Iraq or Iran or in China, catch this, if you run up on that embassy, it's the same as if you ran up on the U.S. and you cross the border of the U.S. If you bomb an embassy, you have bombed America because that is sovereign territory because an embassy, like an ecclesia, 
has the full weight and authority of the government that sent it. Now you know why you are ambassadors of Christ. All those scriptures begin to make sense once you understand the origin of the Ecclesia. So now that we understand the origin of the Ecclesia and the origin of the church, and you understand that it is military in nature, and you are here to colonize, and you are here as an ambassador, and you are here as two or three witnesses with the full weight of Jesus Christ when we rule on a matter. Now do you understand why there must be obedience in the church? Because it's not here to just feed the poor. It's not here come on, to, 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 to just be a cruise ship for amenities and, 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 and Easter plays. No, no, we're not here to just clothe the naked. While we can do that, right, because that is a part of the culture of the kingdom of heaven, right, to have every need met and us sharing uh, all that we have, on, that's a part of the culture, but that is not the full purpose of the church. I had one person come and ask me, uh, you know, and, in, 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 you know, I would have expected them to know. They said, well, you know, why? You know, you teach on warfare a lot. You, 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 you teach on spiritual warfare and fighting a lot. I said, you, th that's because how much does the Bible talk about warfare? The church exists to fight. We are here on a military campaign to colonize. Uh, they use the word colonize, we call evangelize. It's literally colonizing Pomona. We're here to colonize Arizona. We're here to colonize Kenya. And, and you cannot have a military campaign and there's a bunch of lawlessness and rebellion and everybody doing what they want to and coming when they want to and saying what they want to and operating how they want to. There has to be obedience in the church because the ecclesia was a military operation. I'm out of time. We'll be back next week to talk more about the obedience in the church. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your counsel. Uh, we thank you for this foundational setting of this teaching, of this series. We thank you, God, that uh, the people will study your word out to find out whether these things be true. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that as we begin to get understanding of what the church is, why it exists, we will begin to know how to operate and we will get ourselves in order. Everyone did not qualify for the ecclesia. They had to be men ready for war. And this is why we are in the army of the Lord and why Paul said that we need to endure hardship like a good soldier. No wonder you gave, a, gave us weapons of warfare because the gates of hell would try to prevail against the church. But we certainly know, according to your word, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We thank you for your word. We thank you for clarity. And we thank you, Lord, that we'll be Bereans to study these things out. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you can make him Lord tonight. Uh, you can join the ecclesia of God, the body of Christ. Uh, if you recognize that Jesus is the Christ who died on the cross, and it is through him we ascend and descend into earth. The church is the connection between heaven and earth. And if you need a connection, you can climb the ladder today which is Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 1, verse number 51. Listen, you can receive him by repeating this prayer after me. Repeat it after me and say, Dear Lord, I come before you. I realize that I need a Savior. I need a connection to God, and you are that connection. I believe that you're the Son of God, and you died on the cross, and the blood you shed washed away my sins. So Jesus, I invite you into my heart, because I know you got up from the grave, and you're coming back again. Come into my heart and teach me to live for you. I thank you that I am saved by confession of my faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer for the first time, family, you are saved. And now it's time for you to get connected to an ecclesia so you can actually be trained and developed in the kingdom of God, amen? So I want you to go to the Fountain app, fill out the prayer request tab, all right? Go to the prayer request tab and fill out the prayer request form. Let me know you got saved. I have elders that will pray with you and show you what your next steps are. Praise God. Listen, I am so excited to hear from you, and I want you to stay connected so you can grow up in the things of God. Meet me right here again next Wednesday at 7.30. Amen? Let's praise God for those that just gave their life to Jesus. Amen? Before you go, family, I want to give you an opportunity to give an offering that is pleasing unto the Lord. I hope that you were blessed by the Word of God. Some of you may have heard this if you've been with me for a while and 
Some of you may have never heard this before, and some of you just may need to hear it refreshed. I have much more on that because later we're going to be talking about the apostle and also that connection between heaven and earth. So we know why we have to actually obey God and obey the church governments. It is critical. The last thing you want is chaos in war. What if all the privates never did what the captain said or the, or the uh, 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 sergeant said? You would have chaos in war. Listen, we're in war, we're in battle, and it's time for us to line up with the word of God. Amen? Listen, you have several ways you can give here. Uh, look right there on your, uh, on your phone. You can go to our app called Giveify. Look there right there on your screen. You go to Giveify. We have several ways you can give. You can give your tithe or offering, or you can also give tithe online or offering online. What does online mean? That refers to those of you that are watching by TV. And because Wednesday night is all by TV, everyone should be giving tithe online or offering online, okay? Uh, we also, you may notice that there are several other um, options that we used to have that we don't have anymore. Uh, so we, we have made some changes uh, due to some accounting uh, uh, rules that we're abiding by, uh, given our new um, information that we've received from our uh, auditors. And so uh, if you want to give to any other specified fund that you don't see that you used to give to, go right there to other and then specify. You can always put in your notes what you want it to go towards. Amen. Uh, also, you can write your checks uh, to the Fountain Church write a check to the Fountain Church, and you can mail it to 1100 East Holt Avenue, Pomona, California, 91767. And then, of course, we also have our uh, app that you can give on that as well through Subsplash. Uh, you can give uh, in all the different uh, categories there that way as well, or just go right over there to the website at fountainchurch.com, and you can click give, and you can give through Giveify or Subsplash. Praise God. Uh, listen, I want to thank all of you for your faithful support uh, of the ministry. Thank you uh, for supporting all through 2023. Uh, I pray that God uh, calls, uh, calls your mind to be blown by how uh, much you were able to give and to sow. I, you know, a lot of people get excited about how much money they're making. I get excited about how much I'm giving because if I'm giving that much, that means God has blessed me tremendously. Amen. And I pray that he has blessed you as well. Uh, as soon as you're ready, I want you to lift up your phone, uh, touch or sh reach your hand towards the screen. Amen. Uh, you can put up your phone emoji if you're on the chat there. And I want to pray over you before we go. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I bless uh, your people. I thank you, Lord, that their needs are met. I thank you that you're taking care of us no matter what comes upon the nation or the kingdom uh, or the, the nation or the economy. We are taken care of. Why? Because we're simply here as ambassadors. We're connected to another kingdom. Uh, we're not subject to the economy of this world. We're subject to the kingdom that we came from. This is why the Bible says that we are uh, uh, aliens. We are sojourners. We're just here for a moment. We're a part of the kingdom economy, and the kingdom economy has no lack. So I thank you, Lord, for provision more than enough, uh, and our source is you because you are our Jehovah Jireh. We bless you tonight, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, family, before we go, stay connected with your boy. Go to my website, jerrenconeal.com. You can get all my past messages. I did some in-depth teaching on this ecclesia in a series called Age of the Gentiles. This was just a little bit of that uh, Age of the Gentiles. You can check it out there. Of course, you can join the Download Club for $30 a month, get every single message I've ever taught and the ones going forward for 30 bucks a month. And of course, uh, you can catch me uh, with a lot of free teaching on JCO Podcast. Uh, also be sure to log on to see Pastor Mitch on tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, he's our senior pastor over there, lead pastor over there at the Arizona Church. And tonight, somebody say tonight. Tonight I'll be on God TV at 9.30 p.m. Pacific Standard uh, Time or 12.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and they'll catch another episode of Council Culture uh, right there on God TV, which is on Direct TV, on Apple TV, on Roku, uh, the God TV app, or you can go to the website God.tv. All right. And uh, if you go to the app, you can also catch uh, past messages. Just go look up Bishop uh, or excuse me, Council Culture, or you can listen, look up Bishop O'Neill and get past messages. All right, family, join me here this Sunday, 10 a.m. for regular service. You can watch online or be in the house. Listen, we love you so much. You heard the word. Now let's go do it. Peace. Yeah. Yeah.